Hello, everybody. Good evening. Very good evening, Sumi. Good evening. Yes. yes, we'll give time to others and we'll come, come with your questions so you can put it up in the chat in case uh, there are many people. Yeah, so we'll go with the first question. Just give me a moment. Can I ask a question? You can mention your questions on the chat, sir. Okay, thank you. We can start with the first question. While we wait for the others to join in. Yes, I can say. So can I ask? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, while uh, the others can uh, put it down in the chat. Like, uh, you know, I got an image which is turning to 29 or uh, from 28 April. <laughs> Start on uh, 6.30. And the password is the one two three four, but before that the session was over. So that ID and this ID is different. Yes, uh, we had changed the ID. That is the one which we started off with, but uh, since the limit for that ID is only a hundred, uh, hold on. I'm going to just mute everybody for now. Yeah? Okay. So now we have to follow this ID. And what yeah. about that ID? One second. Yeah, I'll just come back to you. All right, uh, so you won't be able to mute yourself. Just type your question. So I look at that and we continue. Uh, so the initial ID that we gave you, which is yes, the password is very simple, one, two, three, uh, was basically uh, a limit of only 100 people. And so the first day that we started, uh, we realized there was a, I didn't know in, during the session, only later on, I got a whole bunch of messages from different people saying others couldn't join. And so we decided to make a new account because that was the account in Karnataka where we are doing Great Invocation every hour and uh, the Twin Hearts every uh, three hours. So that is still on. So from 6 to 6.30, we start off with the Twin Hearts and the Great Invocation. And then I come into this Zoom ID to continue the study group because the numbers are much larger than 100. Yeah. And so there is room for a lot more to join in uh, based on uh, the requests of many others. We've made it a large uh, number. So if you have others who still want to join, they're welcome to join even at this point and continue with the textbook of Theosophy with me. Yes. Uh, all right. All Atma Namaste's for now. All right. How much time will it take for a soul to take a new body? All right. Uh, so from my memory, uh, it depends on the growth of uh, the spiritual growth of that particular person. So by the time you move from the physical life, that is with your physical body and your energy body, then you move into the astral life, then you move into your mental life. And then after that, when you go to the higher mental, which is called the, uh, to make it a little bit more complicated, your causal uh, part of your life, then only will you come back uh, to take on a different body. So that period depends on the evolution, the spiritual evolution of a person. So it could range, uh, in, you've got to remember one thing, that these books were written more than 100 years ago, some of them even 140 years ago. And so man has hopefully evolved to an extent. However, keeping that in mind, the numbers given in Theosophy is about uh, 500, 700 years to go through this whole thing before you could come back into a body. However, if a person is more spiritually evolved, they go through these phases of life in the astral and mental uh, worlds very quickly. And therefore, if they want, they can re reincarnate pretty quickly as well. Yes. So, yes, there is a uh, time that is required as we start to evolve. All right. Okay. So let me see a lot more faces. Yeah. Nice to see all of you. Wow. Kolkata and, uh, oh, okay. We can see Bangalore and there's uh, Oman. Wow. Thank you, people. Wow. Punjab. Jalandhar. Yes. Okay. Nice to see all of you. I'm sure there's a whole uh, bunch more. Let me just go to the questions now. Uh, what's the average number of incarnations for an ordinary person? You've got to remember, we've been uh, through a lot of evolutions. Um, and uh, we're talking about uh, with reference to this particular uh, root race. We are right now in the fourth root race halfway down there. So to evolve to this time has taken a long time as well. 
Now, even at that time, uh, for example, Lord Buddha uh, came 2,500 years ago. Uh, the Lord uh, Jesus came 2,000 years ago. So, you know, to be born in those times would also have been one of our incarnations. Now, if, for example, you were born as a soldier and you were very, very, you know, physical and very tough, uh, one of the things that Master Cho mentioned is that in a different lifetime, you would be then sent to a different type of life where you will have to be more restrictive. Yes. So say, for example, into a monastery where you're not necessarily a monk or something, but then, you know, you can't really start getting physical. Uh, if you are from one religion, which is very, very staunch and very, very strict, then you will be put in a different religion where you will have to learn different things. If you come from a background where everything was, you know, you could do anything and everything and nothing mattered uh, in the course of evolution, you will then be put in a, in a part of the world where things are super strict. Yes. So the point is for all of us to learn from the different experiences in each lifetime to become better and better. Right. And so, uh, uh, for example, uh, there would be a person who loves food at this point in their life. And there's another person who doesn't even care about food. Right. So some of these desires and wants come from your previous lifetime and the life that you, you had at that point. Yes. Now, say, for example, you came from a background where you barely got any food in a previous lifetime. This lifetime, you'll definitely want more. Because the, the need to satisfy the body is somewhere still there in the astral body of, this, of the soul. Yeah. So uh, just, just to go back to uh, that aspect. All right. Then moving on. Okay. So let's look at where we are. Okay. We'll give people another two minutes and then we'll start. Question. When we offer money to beggars, people say we do not because their karma will pass to us. Okay. So let me give you an example. I think uh, many of you might have heard these stories. So when Master Cho would come at the airport in Bangalore City, he would expect us to give him a bundle of 50 rupee notes. And of course, because it's Master Cho, we'll try and go to the bank and get really new notes. So we would give him maybe a bundle or two. And uh, while he comes from the airport to say MG Road, which is about less than five kilometers, on the way, uh, if you know most cities in India, we have what are called traffic lights. And at traffic lights, you have a whole bunch of people who come knocking at your window, especially if you're in a car. And so Master Cho will start taking out this bundle and there goes 50, 100. You know, he just keeps distributing to whoever comes to the door. He continued to do this in other cities as well. And so when he was in Mumbai, and I think this is what Sudhir Bhai shared, uh, he started to do the same thing. He started giving money. And uh, before that, uh, they started knocking on the door. And uh, Sudhir was trying to tell them to go away. And then Master kind of rolled down the window and started giving money. And uh, he said, Master, don't do this because if you give it to them, they're going to come back for more. And he said, if you were in their position, would you like to be helped? And so he explained, Master, you know, you don't know what they're going to do with it. They might drink with it. They might do all kinds of other things. He says, if you were in that position and you couldn't earn for yourself, would you like someone to help you? And so he says, when you give that money, you're giving it to help someone. And your karma ends there. That's it. Now, when that person takes the money from you and what she or he does with it is not your business, is not your karma. Now, yes, maybe because of certain things that happen, you might think maybe money is not the best thing to give. So you might decide to give fruit or you might decide to give biscuits. Interestingly, once you start doing that, when you go to the traffic light, those people will stay away from your car <laughs> because they don't want fruit. They do not want biscuits from you. They want only money. And of course, it cannot be a one rupee coin uh, in Indian terms. It has to be much higher. They'll give it back to you, right? Uh, but one of the things that I also learned from that is to try and teach your children also to learn to give. So if you have a child in the car with you, you have your kids sitting with you, give them the money and tell them, give it to that person. So they also learn to start giving, right? So it's not just for us to learn to give. And so to answer your question, um, your karma ends when you give because you are giving out of the goodness of your heart to help someone. What they do with it after is not your business to an extent. However, if you know that what they're going to do is not helpful, then how will you still 
continue to provide <clears throat> uh, something for them that would be useful. So that is left to your discretion. Yeah. Can we have the IDEO chat group for GI? Okay, I will ask uh, Aditya to type it down uh, in the message later for the six o'clock uh, Great Invocation, sorry, the Twin Hearts followed by Great Invocation. Uh, you didn't actually miss two sessions of uh, the textbook of Theosophy. Yesterday, I actually started all over again, fresh, because there were so many people I understood who couldn't make it, yeah? <clears throat> Okay, something about integral healing by Sri Aurobindo. Mother says she was in Japan. There was a big spread of H1N1. Mother who was in Japan, she got infected. And based on that, she could control the infection of H1N1. All right, uh, thanks for that sharing. But I'm not too sure what the question really is about that. Um, I'm sure because she is so much more evolved, she was able to deal with it. Maybe there were other things that uh, the mother did uh, because of which she could control the infection in her body. Okay. Aditya has messaged here with reference to the ID. Any such miracles in coronavirus? Well, a lot of people, uh, we've had about nine odd people who've recorded it in, uh, in the Delhi Foundation. Healing has been done to them and they have been cured of coronavirus. Uh, we have several cases. Um, uh, my husband and I have just uh, healed uh, a person who was positive and with healing, they have to do two tests in that particular country and both are negative today. So he's, uh, he's fine. So yes, there are many cases where people have started to heal um, victims of the COVID-19 and there have been amazing results. I don't know anyone who um, has actually left the body because of uh, this after healing. What about uh, soul reincarnation for new life? It will happen. Yes, uh, the only time you will not come back, that is your choice, is when you become what is called an arhat. Once you reach that level of oneness with your higher soul, then you do not have to come back anymore. Plus, you should have also completed more, all your karmas. And so that cycle doesn't repeat itself. You go to the next cycle where you try to become one with what, you, what we will talk about now as a divine spark. All right. Okay. So, so we are going to move into chapter two right now. And so if you have your books, uh, please keep them. It's a good reference. How much time in session four? Uh, well, I'm not too sure how many sessions we'll have, but per session is max of one hour, because I think otherwise it becomes too heavy for everybody. Uh, there's a lot of information being given. For some of you who already started reading Theosophy, it might be too simple. For those who haven't started, uh, this might be a little heavy. So that's why we're keeping it slow as possible. For today, I would like to finish chapter two. Uh, what we covered uh, yesterday would be tough to talk about. Uh, the point being that theosophy is a philosophy, a religion, and a science. So we basically spoke about that and the truth in it, uh, which actually helps you, even if you are from a different religion, to understand and appreciate your religion to a great, great extent. Yeah. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, we're going to go to chapter two. Yes. Chapter two is from the absolute to man. Very, very simple. So the absolute or the infinite or the all embracing is who you and I might refer to as a supreme God, the Tao, Allah, whatever name you call it, or the supreme Parabrahman is who they're referring to. And it says here, at our present stage, yes, it is difficult for us to understand everything about the supreme being. Our little brains are but too small to be able to comprehend who this great being is and even more so the plan of the great being. Yes. Um, so to continue, the understanding of this is given a little bit given in the next paragraph. And so it says that of the absolute or the infinite. In it are innumerable universes. In each universe, countless solar systems, 
Each solar system is the expression of a mighty being whom we call the Logos, the word of God. So the Logos refers to the word, yes, or the word of God, the solar deity, Lord Surya or Lord Savitur. He is to it all that man means by God. So whenever you and I pray to the Parabrahman, whether we pray to the great Allah, we can only reach to this level of the solar deity, the solar God, Lord Savitur. And so that's as far as we, you and I can reach. He permeates it. There is nothing in it which is not life. Oops, sorry, I lost myself. Sorry, um, he permeates it. There is nothing in it which is not he. It is the manifestation of him in such matter as we see. Yet he exists above it and outside it, living a stupendous life of his own among his peers. We're talking now of the solar, uh, solar being, yeah? Living among his peers. As is said in the Eastern scriptures, having permeated his whole universe with one fragment of myself, I remain. Yes? And so I'd like to refer to Grandmaster's existence of God. And he says, I think it's much more simplified here where he says, the presence of the Supreme God in the sun and in the solar system is called the solar God in the Indian tradition, the solar Parabrahman is also called Lord Surya or Lord Savitur. In the Egyptian tradition, Amin Ra, Ra means sun, Amin Ra means solar God. So I find the teachings of Master Chua much more simple, yes, compared to what I just read, which sounded so complex. I'm continuing. The solar God is also called the solar logos. Since the existence of the sun, the planets and their moons are, are sustained through the constant use of the sound of the word. Yes. So did that make sense to you? So when we look at the ultimate supreme being, the essence or the presence of that ultimate supreme being in the universes is called the Maxi, the, uh, the uh, Parabrahman of the Maxi universes. And then when it comes to the universe where we belong to, it's called the universal sub supreme Parabrahman. When it comes to our solar system, it's referred to as the solar Parabrahman or Lord Savitur or Lord Surya. Yes, and that's where we are going to look at. And so they say, from that great absolute, this solar system that we're talking about is but only one fragment. Now again, this fragment that we're talking about, or this piece that we're talking about, we can only understand the lower manifestation of this fragment. And so to try and understand it, it says that the system, we may know something in the lower levels of its manifestation. We may not see him, but we may see his powers at work. And so it also goes to say that if you are clairvoyant and you can see the work of the Supreme Being, he says you cannot be an atheist because you can see so much more than what the naked eye can. And to move on, he says, out of himself, he has called this mighty system into being. We who are in it are evolving fragments of his life. Sparks of his divine fire. From him, we all come. Into him, we shall all return. And so this is the understanding. So you have the great supreme being and we've all come down. And that's what Master Chor talks about as the divine spark. And so we are all from him children of God, the divine spark. But however, this divine spark cannot go beyond that level. And so only a part of that divine spark will go further down and manifest as your Atma, as your higher soul. Now from that level, it cannot again further go down. And so only a part of it will further go down to manifest in this body that you and I have to use it. And we become the, the, the soul 
having this body becomes the incarnated soul. Or I'd like to use what Master Choi uses, the Jeev Atma, the Atma that takes on a body to continue to learn its lessons. Yes, and so that's what they're referring to, that we all come from the great being. We are these little tiny evolving sparks or fragments from him or from his life. And that's why since we come from him, we're all children of God, regardless of which religion, which city, which country we all come from. And so many have asked, what is it that he plans to do? So what is it? What is all this about? And so people have tried to understand this, but it is more difficult for this little brain of ours to actually understand this. Yes. And uh, to continue, as I, as I talk about it, we talk about, <clears throat> we talk about the absolute, we talk about the infinite. And then why has he done this? What is his plan? And so in the Gnostic philosophy, uh, this is the best one that the Gnostic philosopher has written. So please listen to me. God is love. But love itself cannot be perfect unless it has those upon whom it can be lavished and by whom it can be returned. Therefore, he put forth of himself into matter and he limited his glory in order that through his natural and slow process of evolution, we might come into being and we in turn according to his will are to develop until we reach even his own level. And then the very love of God itself will become more perfect because it will then be lavished on those, his own children, who will fully understand and return it. And so his great scheme will be realized and his will be done. This, I think, uh, for me personally, has been one of the best explanations given about why and what we are doing here and what is something to do with his plan. Yes. So coming back. So when the essence of God or the presence of God is in our solar system, it's called the solar parabrahman or the solar God. And from that, he says that God or, or uh, he puts himself further down. And then when he comes, he manifests then as the threefold. And so this is why in most of our texts, including Grandma Sachoa's teachings, we then move on to what is called the Trinity. Yes. Or the three aspects. And so from the abs absolute coming down to the solar system level, from there, they say it further goes down into the three. Yes. Uh, to the absolute, it is only but three facets of himself. But to us, they are three separate because they each have their own roles to play. And so it's called the threefold. It's called the Trinity in some religions. It's called the three aspects. Now, from these three aspects, it further goes down. Yes. And this evolution of. So if you look at it, uh, you have the three aspects, which you call divine light, divine love, divine power. Yes. And so it's written here. All of these aspects are concerned in the evolution of the solar system. All three are also concerned with the evolution of man. And therefore, the three aspects are not only in the solar system, but the three aspects are also in you and I. They do not limit themselves only at the level of the solar system. They come down into each one of us. And therefore, we also have the three aspects. And so it says, this evolution is his will. The method of it is his plan. So from the will of God, yes. So from the will of God, we have what is called the plan or the divine plan that is continuing to manifest at this point, And we are part of that divine plan. Now to move on. So from that, uh, from that three, yes. Mysteriously, there is also what you call his seven ministers that come. And his seven ministers, as you can see there, are what you call the planetary spirits. So you have the one, which is the absolute, then you have the Trinity and below that you have the seven ministers or the planetary spirit. Now these uh, beings as, as they continue. Yes. So there under them comes what is called the spiritual beings. So under these ministers come the spiritual beings, which we commonly call as angels and 
devas. And so if you go back to Master Cho's teaching, he says the easiest way to remember this is when you look at white light, when white light goes through a prism, what do you get? The seven colors. But he says out of the seven colors, you have the three primary colors. And so those three primary colors, if you put them together, again, you get the white light. You put the seven together, again, you get the white light. So from the one, you have the three, and from the one, you also have the seven. And you'll notice the same thing happening also with reference um, to what we're talking about as we go on. All right. And so we have the seven ministers. Under them uh, come the spiritual beings, which we uh, most commonly call the angels and devas. So what do these angels and devas do? Now, there are so many, and there are, there's a huge hierarchy in them. Now, overall, we cannot understand all their functions. However, with some of them, we understand they are intimately connected with the building of the system and the unfolding of life within it. Yes. And so yesterday I referred to one of the books that I read, and uh, I think it was also, uh, it was also written by uh, Bishop Laird Beter or C.W. Laird Beter. And it talks about how, you know, every flower that blooms, there are these amazing beings that come together to allow it to bloom. Every fruit that is on the tree, every plant as it continues to evolve to become a tree, there are these amazing beings that, use, that actually come in contact. Uh, and it's like, uh, you know, when you see the construction of a building, you have so many workers. So there are tiny, tiny little devas who do the initial work. And then there is one who's in charge of it. So one petal might have one main person, but the flower would have a, another senior person. So something like that. Now, the same thing happens when you and I are in the process of becoming a human being. So as soon as that sperm and that egg meet and the zygote is created, when that first seed comes down, there is a host of devas who come together then to start creating you. Yes, whether it's your heart that's being built at time, what, that time, whatever is being created starts to work. And then after some time, there's another host of devas that come to create your astral body and another host of angels that come to create your mental body all within that mother's womb. Isn't that amazing? Yes, and then overall, there is one that protects the, the, the entire fetus and is connected to the fetus till it comes out and the whole birthing process is done. So we're just talking about with reference to the, the flowers, with reference to a baby, but this is the same with the entire human um, race on the earth. It includes all the planets in the solar system, the functioning of every being, both which is visible to the physical eye and not visible to the physical eye. So there's a huge hierarchy of them. Let's move on. Now, uh, to remember, this is how it is at this point. However, I'd like to mention one important thing. In the this, in this solar system, especially with reference to us, the, there is an official who represents the solar deity, yes? And, uh, and is in absolute control of all evolution. We may imagine him as a true king of this world. And this great king has what is called departments under him. There are several, several departments. However, we're just going to be talking about two that are mentioned in the book. Yeah. And so you have then for this entire thing, this, this king of the world, and he has under him what is called a set of departments and there are ministers in each of these departments. Now, one of the departments that we will talk about is a department that is in charge of the human race. Yes. And so they say every time there is a new race, there will be a new head to take care of the evolution of that root race or sub root race of the human evolution. And so there is one who will be in charge overall head of the department but under that, you've got to remember everything now becomes seven. So there are seven root races. And so for each root rate, and each root rate has fur, uh, further sub races. We'll come to all that later. But the point is, there will be a head that is, that's like the founder of that root race. And that great being will remain with that root race till it continues its, own, its, its evolution. And then the next one will come to take care of the next uh, root race or the race that is to be formed. Oh, nice doodling there. All right, now, uh, just to continue with this a little bit, let me just add that here and then I'll go back. 
Okay. So in the early stages of development of our human race, yes, the, the officials in the hierarchy, the higher uh, part of the evolution of our human race, were basically beings that came from other races that were far more evolved than ours. Reason? Because we did not have anyone in our human race that had evolved to such an extent that they could take that office. Right? Uh, now, say for example, uh, and I'm not sure if, uh, if it's an apt uh, example, but say for example, when the British came here, they felt that there was no one here that could actually handle, say, construction of roads, construction of the buildings that they liked. So they would have had their own English head. But under them, they had all these workers. But as the Indians started to become better and better, then slowly the Indians started getting higher and higher posts. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's something like that. So in the human race, we did not have anyone who was so spiritually evolved. They had to be evolved at the level of what you call an adept. We'll come to all that later. So until and unless you reach that level, you cannot take that post. And so in the initial days, these officials were all great beings that came from a much more evolved race than our own to help our race evolve. Yes. Now it went to a point later that they realized it's time almost after the fourth root race halfway down, they realized, you know what, I think the human race, you better start coming up with one. And this is something I shared in, in, in last weeks when I had certain sessions going on. And there you realize that there were these two brothers who decided in our entire human race, there were just these two. Um, I'm not talking about blood brothers. I'm just talking about two brothers, uh, two souls, if you can call them, who, who then decided they were ready to take this on. Right. And so out of them, it was Lord Gautama Buddha who decided, listen, I'm going to take it on. And it was a strenuous task, but he decided to take it on and do whatever it was that was required. And at that point, he continued to do whatever it took, many, many incarnations, till in the last incarnation, he was born in the north of India. He was already at that point a bodhisattva. And through that entire incarnation, he moved from a bodhisattva into a Buddha. And so he became the first in our entire human race to have reached that level, yes, uh, which was usually... Uh, given to people who had reached the level of adepts uh, from a different, uh, more evolved race, yeah? Or evolved parts of our, our own uh, solar system. Okay, so we'll come back to this again. So just, just for your understanding at that point, I'm gonna go back again. All right, so where were we? Yes, and so we come to the second department. And so the second department that we would talk about here is the department of religion and education, yes? And so uh, this particular department, uh, if you look at all the great teachers in history that we are aware of, yes, uh, whether it's the great Zoroasters that came, whether it is uh, Lord Buddha himself who came, or Lord Jesus or the Lord Christ, uh, whether it's the Prophet Muhammad, whether it is uh, the great uh, Lord Mahavir, any of these great teachers who came, you know, Confucius, all these great teachers came from this department. And so the basis of all their teachings was the same, actually. However, their teachings, even though the base, the truth was the same, depending on the human race at that time, they would have to give the teachings in a certain manner. But if we look deeper into the teachings, which, which I think for most of us, when we start doing Master Church courses, we realize, oh my God, there is so much similarity. Yes, we start to understand, yes, actually the basis of all the great teacher, whether it was a Lord Krishna, whether it was a Lord Jesus, it's the same. And so going back, uh, so for example, if you look at um, the, if you look at the Hindu religion, which is really, really ancient, the philosophy of the Hindu religion is so old. Uh, they say that we have what, 300 crore gods and goddesses. But my point is, what was the human mental capability at the time when Hinduism was, 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 was uh, given to the human race. Yes. So Master Cho says at the time that, for example, a certain religion was given, say, for example, it's this one, uh, we're talking about Hinduism. He says the human race is equivalent 
to who we call today young children in kindergarten or in the nursery. So I'm going to repeat myself. Some of you would have heard this from me. And so he says, when you want to teach a child who's going to the nursery, yes, the concept of what is, uh, say, a rectangle, yes, or what is uh, a circle, how do you teach them this? The only way to teach little kids concepts like that is to either show them, like I did right now, or to draw it, yes? And or actually show them physically, okay, by the way, that is a circle out there, that is a rectangle, that is a triangle. And so little kids need form to understand. Also, with little kids, they love stories. Yes or no? If you tell them stories, they can sit and listen to the concept even better. And so going back to who you and I were at that point, the only way we could understand the concept of the Supreme Being or the Trinity or any of that was if it was in a form. And if you said God was everywhere, then that person said, oh, God is everywhere, then I worship everything. Yes, from the earth to the air, to the water, to the sand. So if you look at the tribals, if you look at people that still uh, continue to do this all over the globe, there's nothing wrong with what they do. Sometimes I think these people are more in touch with the aspect of God and the respect that they give to Mother Earth, to the water, to the plants, to the trees is truly amazing compared to us who are supposed to be so much more evolved. Yes. And so the con concepts continue to stay there. However, as we started to evolve as a human race, then the teachings started to change. And the most recent of all has been the teachings by Prophet Muhammad, where God is formless. And the teaching says you cannot connect to anything that has a form. So they're trying to head to that part because still then people still got stuck with form. Even in the Christian tradition, partially, uh, which is slightly older than the uh, Islamic re religion, still has certain forms. Yes, but here they realized, and what Master Cho mentions also, sometimes people got so caught up with all these images and idols that they forgot the Supreme Parabrahman. And so one of the last religions was, listen, go back to the Supreme Parabrahman. Parabrahman. Worship the great being. That was basically what they were trying to say. All right, so coming back. So all the teachers came from this, uh, this part and the teachers came from what you call the great white brotherhood. Again, the adepts. Yes, because obviously they had to come to that level. Only then they could take this particular role. So let's move on. Is it okay so far? Can you put your hands up if you can, if it's okay? Not too, too crazy. Okay, so I can see quite a few hands. The others, I'm assuming your hand is just invisible right now. It's okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the blue hands as well. All right. So let's move on. So we're talking about these two departments that were created. And therefore, let's look at these two departments a little bit more. And then more or less, we're going to finish off with this chapter. And so let me read a few lines from here. Therefore, all religions have contained a definite statement of truth and in its fundamentals, this truth has been always the same. The inner truth has always been the same. However, based on the human race, it has then taken on certain shapes, yes, uh, and, and certain, in some cases, even confusion and um, a lot of contradiction. And so he says, for the teacher is always one sent from the great brotherhood of adepts and in all its important points, in its ethical and moral principles, the teachings has always been the same. So they repeat it several times to help us realize and maybe get it into our, our thick skull that the teachings are actually the same. The truth is the same. That's the baseline for all the religions. And, uh, and so it says, there is in the world a body or, or truth which lies in the back of all religions. And when people do not have this or are ignorant of this aspect, then they tend to have a lot more questions. However, Masacho also has mentioned, and I think the book also here somewhere mentions that as man becomes more intelligent, these questions will arise. So it's a good thing to, to question. There's nothing wrong with it. And so he says, people start disputing and having arguments, whether there is a God, uh, whether man survives death, whether definite progress is possible for him. 
and what is the relation uh, to the universe. And he says, uh, for those who really seek to find these answers, he says, when you make the effort, you will find the answers, right? For some of us, some of us it might just take five, day, five years. Some of it might, it might take more than 15 years. And so I remember there was a student, uh, I think uh, somewhere in Iran, he's a Sufi student. And he came to do the Arhapic prep class. I think it was with Acharya Dani and Sri Ram. And uh, at that point, uh, he was so amazed by the valuable teachings that the course was giving him in two days. He says, you know, can I share with the class that what you are teaching me are the questions that I have been seeking and searching globally for 17 years. And we are so lucky. We just sit in that class two days. Yes, it's all clear. I understood. And you go back, not realizing the value of what you've got. And for him, it was so precious that I don't think he ever stopped probably practicing. I, I don't know the man to, to question. But I think, you know, when you take the trouble for looking for the question and seeking the answer, rather you have to have the right question to seek the right answer. And then when you find it, it's so valuable, it's so precious. But when it just falls in your hand, <laughs> sometimes we all take it for granted, right? <laughs> And then we realize, oh okay, my God, Master, what you've given us is so much more simple. So every time I read this book, I'm like, oh my God, what he's talking about is um, so much more simple in Grandmaster Choi's, you know, either the soul book or the Arhatic that he's given us, the notes there. It's truly amazing. So let me move on. Um, so Okay, so remember we were talking about uh, the religion aspect. So we're moving out of this uh, uh, teacher aspect. We're going to go into uh, the person who has to try and take those um, important official roles in the hierarchy of our entire system. And so I did mention that people, uh, sorry, these great beings, these great adepts came from outside. And then I mentioned how Lord Buddha was the first. And uh, this, as time goes, the second in... in uh, obviously a bodhisattva right now would be the Lord Christ. Yes, also referred to as Lord Maitreya. So at the end of our seventh root race, towards the end, yes. And so they say that these great beings who take on, for example, we spoke about um, the department of education and religion. Now, when it is really, really required, we spoke about all teachers coming out of that department. When it's really, really important, he himself, the head, will reincarnate to also teach the human race to help its, uh, its, uh, to progress uh, and help it go forward with its evolution. Yes. And so towards the end of this seven, seventh root race, then the Bodhisattva, the present Bodhisattva, Lord Maitreya will incarnate himself to help the human race push through that last thing so it can go further. Right. So besides these two great, uh, two great brothers who've gone ahead of all of us. There are several who've attained the level of the adept from different parts of the world. Yes, it's not just from one part of the world, but there've been several of them. Uh, so it says here, men not of one nation, but of all the leading nations of the world, rare souls who with indomitable courage have stormed the fortress of nature, understood the secrets of, uh, or rather the innermost secrets of uh, the system and have earned the right to be called adepts. So there are many more right now. Uh, we're talking about since 2,500 plus years ago. Uh, but always some of these who reach that level of the adept are still connected to us. They don't all go away. And so next week when we do uh, come together for the Vesak, we realize that the oldest brother uh, Gautama Buddha hasn't left us as well. And he decided and he will always come back on that one special day to continue to shower blessings on all of us who are receptive and who are aware of the energies to help anchor it further. And so they say, but always some of them remain within touch of our earth as members of the hierarchy, which has in charge of the administration of affairs of the world and the sp spiritual evolution of our human race. And so even though they've gone beyond, they don't have to come, they will still be here. The august body is often called the great white brotherhood again. Yeah, so we're we referring to them one more time. Okay. 
So keeping this in mind and realizing that there is this amazing path that we can all take. Yes. So if you are really interested and do seek the truth, right? Uh, it does go to say that. Um, and so I, I had left this question, which I forgot to share with you uh, before we more or less try to end this. So the book continues to say there are adepts and masters, but interestingly is these adepts or the masters are looking for apprentices. So do you want to be one? Do you want to become an apprentice of this great adept? Yeah. And so that's going to be my last question before I so um, wind up with this particular thing. So he says, if you really want, yes, if you really want to uh, move ahead, he says, any man who will may, sorry, any man who wants to can and may attract the attention of one of these great beings. And so how do you do this? But to do this, he has to show himself worthy of their notice. No need for fear that his efforts will go unseen or unnoticed. That is impossible. For the man who is devoting himself to service, such as this, stands out from the rest of humanity like a great flame in a dark night. A few of these great adepts who are thus working for the good of the world are willing to take as apprentices those who have resolved to devote themselves utterly in the service of mankind. Such adepts are called masters. Yes, and so to remember when you start to purify yourself on a regular basis, start to do your meditation. And when more and more of this divine energy comes through that spiritual cord, your soul light will start to shine because there is no hindrance. There is no impurity within you. And so whether you look pretty or handsome or you're young or old, it doesn't matter to them. They just know that that soul is ready. The light is shining. They will then figure out if you're interested, you have the job. If you're not interested, no problem. Yeah. So, uh, so Helen Petrovna Blavatsky, yes, uh, was a great soul. And she was one of these apprentices. So she, along with Colonel Henry Steele, all caught, sorry, they're the ones who founded the Theosophical Society. And they started to write books to help people understand more about uh, the greater aspect of life. And so it was only later when Mr. A.P. Sinet joined them, did he make the works or the teachings of theosophy much more probably simplified and easier for the Western world and for the rest of the world to understand. And so uh, that's when Bishop Ladbeater says, it's only because of the writing of this great man that I came in contact with Theosophy and later on also with Ma Madame Blavatsky. And so when he met with Madame Blavatsky, he says, so how can I then do what I can so that they will notice me and take me on as an apprentice? Yes. Uh, so if that is what you want to do this lifetime, so here are some of the things that he says. So he says, when I asked Madame Blavatsky how one could learn still more how one could make definite progress along the path, which she pointed out to us, she told me of the possibility that the only way to gain such acceptance was to show oneself worthy of it by earnest and altruistic work. That is the only thing. When you do, when there is selfless love and you serve your brothers and sisters around, that's when it will show and they will start to see you. She told me that to reach that goal, a man must be absolutely one-pointed. Yes, and so going back to Master Chua's constancy of aim and effort and one-pointedness. And then further it says, um, one of these masters himself has said, quoting him, in order to succeed, a pupil must leave his own world and come into ours. And so you need to let go of, you know, power and wealth and possession, because once you join them, all these things will not matter to you. 
She warned us clearly, though, that the way was difficult to tread. People will misunderstand, yes, uh, by people who are still around you. They will not understand you. So how many of you find this very, very, very familiar? <laughs> okay. There is nothing to look forward to, but the hardest of hard work. <laughs> so you heal, you teach, and then you feel it's not going anywhere. You meditate and you're not seeing this amazing light <laughs> that they're talking about. Uh, so you, you have to keep going. And it says, uh, one could foretell, no one can actually tell you how long it would take to arrive at your destination. Yes. So it's a path they say you can't bring anything with you. It's going to be a very simple life. At the same time, they don't tell you how long it is. They'll say you'll be misunderstood. It's going to be very difficult. <laughs> but he says he and the others took on this journey joyfully. And they said they never regretted anything that they ever did. And so he says, after some years of work, I had the privilege of coming in contact with the great masters of wisdom. And then I learned many things from them. Yes, so you need to earn your place. You need to be able to find that point and then you will go. And then they will teach you a lot more. Some of which you have, because of your progress till that point, have understood and you realize, hey, this is how it works. But the other part that they tell you will, will be something that you can deduce because of what you've already gone through. But you take it on as a hypothesis, which we spoke about in chapter one to further take it to a different level. Yeah, and so, um, so to attain the honor of being accepted as an apprentice of one of the masters of wisdom is the object set before any student, but this means a determined effort. So earlier they said one-pointedness, now they're saying effort. So going back to constancy of aim and effort and one-pointedness. So you will have to, be willing to put in all the necessary effort. The, no the knowledge is so transcendent that when a man grasps it fully, he becomes more than man and he passes beyond his kin or his brothers and sisters around. But there are stages even in this progress. Yeah. And so to almost end the session, let me go to the stages. So it says, it's like a ladder of evolution. The primitive stand at its foot. We who are civilized beings have readily climbed part of the way, but those we can look back and see, so sorry, but though we can look back and see rungs of the ladder below us, which we have already passed, we may also look up and see many rungs above us in which we have not yet attained. So when you look at a ladder, you have those steps. So you're on one step. Yes. But when you look down, you realize, oh, wow, I've already finished five steps. But when you look up, there's a lot more that you have to work towards and move up. And so he says, just as men are standing even now on each of the, let me just call it steps below us, so that we can see the stages by which man has mounted or climbed. So also are there men standing on each of the steps above us so that from studying them, we may see how man can mount or climb to the future. So because they've gone ahead of you, yes, you know that there is a way to get up and there is literally someone one step ahead of you. Yes, so they can always show you the way. So those who stand high above us, so high that they seem to us as gods, in their own marvelous knowledge and power, tell us that they stood not long before where you and I are standing now. And they indicate to us clearly the steps that lie in between, which we also must tread if we would be as they. And that's the end of chapter two. Yes. All right. I hope that made sense to you um, and it wasn't too heavy and too crazy. So uh, we have a couple of minutes. So let me see if I can unmute. Okay. So someone who wants to talk, if you put your hand up, I'll try and unmute you. I think that will be the fastest way. So because I have so many hands already because of the earlier things. So 
<laughs> You'll have to remove those hands and tell me who wants to really talk. Okay, there are a couple of questions here. So no one has a question, right? Okay, I'm going to unmute you for a bit. Okay, that's very Okay. I'm not too sure who that is. Okay. Sorry. Anybody has a question? You can. Um, Hello. So I, me. I have a question. Hold on. Yeah. Now you can unmute yourself and come back, please. I was trying to just reduce the noise on on that one particular. Uh, May I have sent a question to you privately? I. It was not on the group. I don't know. By mistake, I have sent it probably. All right. So do you want to el elaborate that question because there are several here? No, no, that was related to yesterday's uh, discussion. You said uh, if you have a physical problem, you had to type for that, specifically for that. How is that? That okay. is number one. And one more question. Do we have to necessarily do 10% of your earning? What if, uh, no, because, uh, yeah, yes. current situation, I'm not able to give 10%, so what? I'm into financial problem. All right. Um, so the first thing is, um, if, say, for example, you have a problem with your intestines, uh, then you try and find uh, an organization that helps people with uh, intestine issues. Now, this is based on my personal uh, work with Master Chua. So, for example, there was a gentleman who had intestinal cancer back in the States going for surgery. And Master Chua asked him to get in touch with me. And uh, Master Chua says, when the money comes, you have to use it purely for surgery of the intestine. So since I had contacts with, uh, with hospitals here and also with some rotary people, we were able to find several uh, places where we could get this uh, surgery done. And so it didn't stop there. And then he would send me, you know, someone else who had a different issue in a different part of the body, a heart and different things like that. And so I realized that when you have a condition of a certain type, then you need to do that. Now, let me give you another story. This was in Hyderabad. There was this young girl uh, who was uh, studying medicine and in the process of that they have to look at their own blood and when she looked at her blood she realized that she had something wrong with it and when the professor looked they realized that she had leukemia now okay. her parents were already into her hatha yoga so uh, parents were very upset uh, master Chua came to hyderabad and they were like you know how can this happen we've done so much for prana healing we've been tithing how could this happen to our daughter and then the trustees took them away but the the girl uh, stayed back and she says master what should i do and so master says what do you need? And she says, I need good blood. And he says, well, that's what you need to give. He also assigned healers to do regular healing uh, for her. So she would give all her pocket money and whatever money she would earn uh, to the hospital's uh, blood bank. And uh, with healing and with what she did, a couple of years later, uh, I, I think uh, two or three years, she actually went to London to continue her studies. And I think uh, three years later, I actually got a card. It was her wedding card. Yes. Okay. So things, uh, basically, you need to give it in that area if you can, if that's a possibility, or find an organization. For example, that's how MCK's Trust Fund or your local Food for the Hungry Foundation, if you belong to one, normally supposed to do, yeah, to try and help. Now, the second one with reference to tithing, especially when you have financial uh, difficulty. Like I said, your financial karma is really, really high. And so um, the story is from the Philippines where this young man went to uh, the, the priest at the church to say, I'm having difficulty. I have 5,000 uh, pesos and that's not enough for me to go ahead. And so the priest said, okay, let's have a contract. You give me 10% of what you earn and let's see what happens. And so he says, no, father, I think you, you misunderstood what I said. I, I have only 5,000 and 5,000 is what I cannot live with. So giving you 500 doesn't help because I still can't live with what I already have. So they either take it or leave it. So then he says, okay, fine, let me do it. He somehow managed to give him 500 every month. And in a year, 
he started to do much better financially. And after I think three years, he was then tithing 5,000. And so he realized, oh. you know, when I first went to the priest, I was giving only 500. And now I've gone to 5,000. Maybe I should renegotiate with the priest. And so he goes back to the priest and he says, you know, Father, can we look at changing this contract? He says, no problem. We can. You, you go back to how you were before and you can give me 500. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the story Master Cho gave us. So one, one last question, I'm really thank you. For financial, so you tied for a specific reason or uh, any, anywhere? Any, no, any um, you see, one of the things that uh, I would look at doing is to try and find, especially maybe after the COVID-19, there are going to be a lot of uh, smaller organizations who are going to be financially in debt. So if you can find people in villages, you know, where they need to pay something very small, like 500 to get out of their debt, or someone with just a thousand rupees, which may be easier for you to give. When you help someone come out of their debt, the law says you will then come out of your debt. You understand what I'm saying? So if you okay, can find something it. like that, it would be easier. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. You're most welcome. Uh, yes. Uh, could you just explain me about uh, Master told 150 years for our root race. Um, we must actually work fast because in 150 years there will be a change. What does he mean by that change? Okay, I'm not too sure what you meant by uh, the root race here. All I know is that Masachoa has a plan for heaven on earth in 150 years. Yes, uh, now he says heaven on earth can be attained if we go through this uh, progress where you're able to bring in so many arhat yogi, so many pranic healers, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, to be able to bring three holy masters uh, is the ultimate level. Uh, and when that happens, there will be heaven on earth. Yes. Now, how is this to be attained? The, the only way that we understand at this point is for you and I to bring more and more people onto the spiritual path. Is it only our school that is going to bring heaven on earth? No, obviously not. Uh, like I said, the great beings have so many pupils who are teaching in different paths. It is the collective plan of the higher being. And Master Cho is just helping us understand part of that plan, which is uh, if we can do this, we can achieve heaven on earth in 150 years. Yeah. Now, if you look at the present situation, you'll notice that the world has come not really to a standstill, stand but definitely a time for everyone to reflect. Re reflect on how they want to continue with their life ahead. Do they continue to be busy and crazy? Or do they want to actually slow down and enjoy life and enjoy being with family and doing things? Because maybe we were going too fast. This was like a break given to the whole earth. It's not just India. It's just not uh, Middle East. It's just not Africa. The whole earth is literally, the breaks are on at this point. It is time for us to reflect and see how we want to take our life further. Yeah. Uh, Atma Namaste, Sumi. Can I ask yes. one question? Yes, I'm going to take two more questions because I think, like I said, I do not want to take you away from your family. I do not want to take you away from your dinner. So two more questions and then we'll wind up today's session. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much. Welcome. Sumi, you told the king of the world, the king of the world. By the word king of the world, do you mean Sanat Kumara? Uh, we'll come to that a little later. Yes. Uh, we were talking about actually the king of the present system, the solar system. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you said about yeah. two brothers. Yes, you the two brothers. Two brothers. I yes. want more clarity on that, please. Uh, well, the two brothers is basically Lord Buddha and the Lord Christ. Um, so, at an earlier point, uh, that is two thousand five hundred years ago, Lord Buddha was only a bodhisattva, and in that lifetime, when he was Prince Siddhartha, he moved from being a bodhisattva to the next level on the spiritual hierarchy, which is the Buddha. And so that was a title given to him, the first of us who reached that level. Uh, the second is the Lord Christ, who is presently still the Bodhisattva, also referred to as Lord Maitreya. And in due course, that is, uh, we are right now in our fourth root race. When we go to the seventh root race, he will incarnate himself to then move on from being a Bodhisattva. And he will also attain the level of being a Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this reminds me of the CPS session. Last question. Last. I think I'll have to get Sri Ram to come and say, Sumi, stop. <laughs> yes. The fourth uh, ray, we are uh, in root ray. Uh, each day, we, we are taking so many incarnations to come to this uh, uh, 
Um, yes, you definitely have. I presume that's Lakshmi. So uh, we have gone through many, many incarnations to reach this point. So if you look at seven, so let me put that as seven. Okay, so we have seven, yes? We have come to the fourth and we are right in the middle. So we have just taken the U-turn. If you look at the evolution of any of the... Um, any of the human, any of the races, we are right in the middle point. We're taking the U-turn to go towards hopefully an upward trend. Yeah, so things right now should go much faster. And I think that we've already seen those of us who've been born for the last uh, uh, 40 to 50 years or 60 years, we'll realize life has changed really fast. Yeah? Thank you so much. You're most Thank welcome. You. Yes, people, shall we end? I need to say a Thanksgiving prayer. All right. Thank you. Close your eyes, connect onto your palate. Feel yourself in the presence of the Supreme Being, who is referred to as the Absolute, the Supreme Parabrahman, the Great Allah, the Tao. Be aware of the countless blessings for eons of time all through our evolution that this great being has always showered blessings upon us. Feel gratitude, respect, and love to the Supreme Being. To our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Koksui, to Lord Maha Guruji Neling, without whom none of this would be possible for us to comprehend and understand so easily and quickly. To all the great teachers of Theosophical Society, to all the great ones, to all the beings of knowledge, light, and power, to the great white brotherhood, to the host of angels and ministers of knowledge, of light, of power, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your great, great blessings. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and your divine protection. We especially thank you for all the priceless teachings, for all the knowledge and great wisdom that's been imparted to us today. We ask you to help us to absorb and assimilate this knowledge Good night. Take care. Bye -bye. and to use it to become better Thank divine you. instruments you for God. You Thank you. Bye -bye. Atma, namaste to everyone. I think someone is already saying bye <laughs> early enough. But anyway, Atma thank you, everyone. Namaste. Thank you, Atmanavaste. Atmanavaste, Sumi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sumi. Atmanavaste. Atmanavaste. Thank you, Sumi. Atmanavaste, ma'am. Bye. Thank you, Atmanavaste. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. If there are others who still want to join and if they can catch up on the first two chapters, they are welcome to join. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bon appetit again. Enjoy your dinner with family. You too. Thanks. Bye. Thank heading, you. Heading. Is, this Thank the, you. is this the ID we join tomorrow? Yes, this is the only ID for the study group. The rest is for uh, the twin hearts, the earlier one. Yes. Yeah, because the flyer study group ID, we were there and it did not work. Yes, that is the old one. Uh, what I explained was uh, we had only a capacity of 100. This is a capacity of 1,000. So you can join and your friends can continue to join. No problem. Yes? Okay, thank you. Don't worry about coming late. You can still join. Bye. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.